Ever since man first jumped on the back of a horse, he's been obsessed with horsepower and speed, forever seeking something to transport him faster and faster. The supercar tag may be a relatively new one, but they've always been there. Back in 1955, this classic gullwing Mercedes 300 SL would have deserved the title. It can do over 150 miles an hour, and in those days, you could do that legally on the roads of England. With today's fastest road car, you definitely can't. It's capable of 230 miles an hour, and it's expensive, very expensive. A gala ball at the stately Goodwood House is the sort of classic occasion that makes you feel like a million dollars. So naturally, you do your best to look a million dollars. And just to maintain the impression, you want to drive home in a car that befits the splendor of the occasion. Now, if you actually have a million dollars to spare, you might just choose a McLaren F1. At a price of £540,000 plus tax, you should also get some change for your million. And you'll get more than just a fabulous looking car with an awesome engine in the back. The McLaren F1 is the dream concept of its designer, Gordon Murray. Back in 1988, his Grand Prix McLaren was winning everything, but that was designed by his team of 30 engineers, and Murray is a man who derives most pleasure from completing a concept that is entirely his. He wanted out of the Grand Prix scene, and Ron Dennis gave him the green light to build his ideal road car. It had to be usable, fast, safe, and above all, a real driver's car. It also needed to reflect the experience and technology of McLaren. Every little detail, right down to this engraved instrument insignia, had to satisfy Murray's precise specification. Thirty years earlier, his college sketchbooks were filled with variations of a three-seater layout. To Murray, it was the only solution. The driver would sit in the optimum position, in the middle. Ahead of the fuel tank and ahead of the engine. A Formula One style layout and naturally a Formula One style construction that starts with this. It was only just over 10 years ago that McLaren built the first ever Grand Prix car with a carbon fibre monocoque. Lightweight and very strong, yet it starts life as no more than an expensive roll of cloth. Each car is a jigsaw of 5,000 pieces of resin impregnated carbon fibre pressed around 70 different moulds in anything from 2 to 17 layers. Each mould is bagged up and held in a vacuum before being cooked for 3 hours in this huge oven under 90 psi pressure at 125 degrees centigrade to bond it together. The cured carbon fibre pieces are then stuck together rather like building a giant airfix model with full size parts until you have a complete body shell ready for the paint shop. From paint shop to assembly shop, this is chassis number 001, McLaren's own car. 002 and 003 have already been delivered to their lucky owners. This is 005 and ahead of it 004. With an output of just three cars a month, this is as long as the assembly line gets. It takes 6,000 man-hours to complete a car which expresses engineering excellence, brilliant packaging, 
quality finish and a fanatical attention to detail. Gold is the best heat reflector, so the engine bay is lined with gold. Murray turned to BMW for his engine. The 6.1 litre non-turbo V12 produces 627 horsepower. Murray only asked for 550, so he wasn't too unhappy when the engine came out 16 kilos heavier than the 250 he'd specified. Stress goes up. Weight is one of Gordon Murray's obsessions. Saving it meant more expensive materials. Magnesium wheels, aluminium alloy brake calipers and an Inconel and titanium exhaust system which is 67 kilos lighter than normal steel. Even the spanners in the special toolkit are made of titanium. The finished shape is the work of stylist Peter Stevens, who already had the Lotus Elan and Jaguar XJR15 to his credit before he began working with Murray to clothe the F1 in a shape that not only looked good, but performed to the designer's requirements. So, have all Gordon Murray's dreams come true? Is this a usable supercar? Well, it's light and easy to drive, the visibility is superb, the engine will dawdle along as slow as you want it to, and here in the middle there's a CD sound system all around you that's been honed to perfection. And there's even room to take the whole family shopping. Parking is a doddle, and there's no problem with opening the doors. I can go for an 18-hole lap of the Goodwood Park Golf Club. I've even got enough luggage space to pack up and head off for a weekend in the country. In fact, the two pannier lockers give the McLaren the same storage volume as a Fiesta boot. And under the floor there are spare fuses, bulbs and a first aid kit. So this really is a supercar you could use every day. But I can't really see the owners doing the shopping. They'll have staff to do that, a helicopter for the golf course and a Learjet for the weekend away. What the buyers of this McLaren F1 will want to do, and what you've all been waiting for me to do, is give it some stick. I think we better find a private circuit. Of course, you'll have to hire a track like Goodwood, but that's only pocket money. It's here that Murray's real talent comes to the surface. He wanted instant steering response, and that means a low polar moment of inertia. So, minimum overhangs front and rear, and the main masses, engine, fuel and occupants, as close to the centre of gravity as possible. The suspension must have the effect of a racing car, but the comfort of a road car. And the McLaren solution is something they call ground plane shear centre subframes at the front and inclined shear axes at the rear. All of which translates into some pretty impressive performance. On this Goodwood racetrack, this McLaren is unbelievable! But perhaps the most impressive part is the engine! It just goes on accelerating, accelerating and accelerating! But it's not just the 627 horsepower of the V12, but it's the massive torque of the motor! Whatever gear you're in, if you open the throttle, there's a massive power through this chicane in second. Open the power and whoa, wheel spin in second, third, fourth. Just accelerates on and on and on, braking. Very impressive that foil coming up at the rear to keep the car stable under braking. But it's opening this throttle, which you just cannot believe how quick this car goes. The handling is, well, it's an exceptional for a car with this power. But of course, good though the handling is, it's still a lively car. As mild understeer as you turn in. But once you've got the power on, the only thing you're going to get is oversteer. It sounds so glorious behind you. Turn in, this long corner, a bit of oversteer. Up to third. A bit more oversteer. Oh! On this straight now, I'm up to fifth. Up to sixth gear and it's still accelerating harder. 
going hard. I just went 160 there. Do I stamp on the brakes? Into Woodcock third gear. Oh, and you just want to roll from the car. Down to second. To left back. The F1 has been a long time coming, but it's been worth the wait. 0 to 60 in 3.2 seconds and an unofficial 231 miles an hour should set the standard for years to come. The McLaren F1 has everything you ever wanted in a supercar. Except perhaps if you want to check a traffic report before you head home, then you're stuck. The F1 doesn't have a radio. Gordon Murray doesn't listen to the radio. It still makes my heart beat faster every time I see that video, and the mighty McLaren may well be the ultimate in supercar thrills. But if your budget won't stretch to a million dollars, then fear not because you can have almost as much fun with £20,000 and 120 horsepower. Back in the swinging 60s, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones were top of the pops. Jim Clark and Lotus were scorching to Grand Prix win after Grand Prix win. And on the telly, Diana Rigg wore black leather and drove a Lotus Elan. It was the small sports car of that decade. Light, responsive and a delight to drive. It was the epitome of Colin Chapman's design creed. Sadly, its successor some 25 years later was not. Front wheel drive with a far eastern turbocharged engine. It had superb road holding, but it just wasn't any fun. It lacked the driver involvement of the older car. That responsive steering, that live wire feedback to put a smile on your face. But now there's a new Lotus that will do just that. The Lotus Elise. The Elise was named after the granddaughter of Romano Artioli, chairman of the Bugatti Group, which owns Lotus and fits neatly into the E theme of all Lotus names from the first elite to the Esprit. Both Lotus and Bugatti have seen hard times lately and money to develop the new sports car and the V8 version of the ageing Esprit was hard to find. The company has a lot resting on this little roadster and on looks alone, I think they're on to a winner. Even standing still, the Elise is a stunner. Styled in-house by designer Julian Thompson, it's easy to spot cues from other sports cars in amongst its curves. The grille from the Lotus Elite. The vents from the GT40. Side intakes that could have been penned by Bertoni. The whole shape is so much tauter than the flabby MGF. Getting in requires a bit more athleticism than most. And once you drop into the slither of leather that they call a driving seat, you realise just how spartan the interior is. There's no carpets, no electric windows and no radio cassette. Which is probably a good thing because there's nowhere to put your cassettes. Indeed, the interior is so spartan that the passenger seat doesn't even move and the only gesture towards any sort of luxury is this little pump-up lumbar support. Now, if it's not enough that this Elise looks sensational, how about the fact that it drives sensationally? The ride is relatively soft by small sports car standards, which is good for comfort, but can be bad for the handling. Yet this Elise is almost perfect. Drains and potholes cause the suspension to clonk and rattle. You feel the bumps through the seat of your pants, but you don't feel them through the steering. And it's the weight, feel and responsiveness of this steering that gives such pleasure. 
and you point your leads into a corner, it goes where you want it to go. Even the cable operated gear change provides satisfying movements unless you try to get fifth gear. But then if you're trying to get fifth gear, you're not having fun. Unlike every Lotus since that original Alain, the Elise doesn't have a backbone chassis underneath its fiberglass bodywork. Instead, it's got a space frame fabricated from extruded anodized aluminium bonded together with a special epoxy adhesive, all built and supplied by the Danish Hydro Aluminium Company. All up, the car weighs only about 700 kilograms, so even the meagre 118 horsepower supplied by the mid-mounted Rover K-Series engine is enough to get you from 0 to 60 in five and a half seconds. The driving position is perfect. The instrumentation, simple and effective. For me though, it is a shame that the interior specification is so minimalistic. Oh yes and the fact that the Elise has got a hood from hell. The changing North Yorkshire weather gave us plenty of opportunity to curse the Elise's hood. It's as if the designers couldn't decide which kind of fastenings to use, so they used them all. Once on, the hood doesn't spoil the car's lines, but by the time you've got it up, the sun has probably come out again. Allowing us to look at some of the Elise's cleverer features, like a nose which acts as a spoiler with air ducted from the grille through the radiator and out of the two vents in the bonnet. The suspension is wishbones all round with some very trick aluminium disc brakes at each corner. The whole of the bottom of the car is flat and there's a diffuser at the back which Lotus say adds 15 kilos of downforce. Time to put racing engineering on a race track. you really need to get onto a private track to push the Elise right to its limits and there's none more demanding in Britain than this croft circuit near Darlington. Only now can I really push the Elise on into the corners and that wonderfully responsive steering now comes even more alive and I can feel the body roll, the soft suspension allows quite a bit of initial roll but then the car takes a set and responds beautifully. Unlike the more recent Elan, which was such a disappointment because it cornered as if on rails, this little Elise can be quite frisky. The Elise has mild understeer as a basic setup, but push the car into a corner quickly or lift off suddenly in the middle of a bend, then there is oversteer of plenty to play with. It's not a sudden breakaway, more a progressive slide to be enjoyed rather than feared. Lotus intend to produce about a thousand Elise's a year and if you pay your £20,000 now you might just get your Elise by next September. If some foul fate does befall Lotus it won't be the fault of this fabulous little car. Hello Patsy. Yeah look I think I might have found the perfect small sports car. No 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 not the MGF that's too bland for me. No it's the Lotus Elise. The best looking best handling small sports car ever. Anyway, look, I'm just calling to say the traffic around here is simply awful. So it looks like I'm going to be late. A uh, couple of days. Think of James Bond and you think of three things. Firstly, the martini. Shaken, not stirred. Then the elegant companions sleek, low-mileage models. And thirdly, 
Well, I'm going to be rather busy testing the first two, so I'll let double O Jeremy introduce you to the third. This was the car Bond used in the living daylights, with its huge V8 engine, those skis, the laser tyre shredders, the added performance bonus of rocket propulsion and a brace of guided missiles up front. It made mincemeat of the Czech police force's larders. The trouble is that the modern day equivalent of this car costs £180,000 and that's before you start adding any toys. Now, M simply can't justify that kind of outlay these days, especially when the only time he encounters the Russians is when he pops down to the embassy for tea and buns. So, what's Bond going to get then? A proton? I rather think not. This is the Aston Martin DB7, perhaps the most beautiful car Britain has ever made. As a result, it's the seemingly obvious choice for any triangular torsoed secret service Johnny. And the Treasury won't mind either, because it costs only £80,000. And a do mean only, because £80,000 is what you pay these days for humdrum cars like BMWs, Mercedes. £80,000 for an Aston Martin is cheap. Tiffany Dell could afford three. Except Tiffany Dell doesn't like the DB7. Has the man gone mad? He says it's too soft, too cosseting, and that round a track a Porsche 928 would make mincemeat of it. Round a track maybe, but on ordinary roads the DB7 makes the 928 look like a skateboard. It glides over bumps that would shatter Porsche man's spine. And yet, despite this, I'm not talking here about a sponge. Indeed, this car holds the road like it's been nailed there. Even when the roads are more like rivers, it is still a dream. I'm talking about the sort of dream where you're James Bond, where you learn you can fly, where you're married to Michelle Pfeiffer, and where your doctor says you have to live on a diet of nothing but lobster thermidor, and that the NHS will pay. So, what we're talking about here is a refined, comfortable, grown-up car. And that's in keeping with the interior, which is a far cry from the Habitat meets McLaren nonsense that Tiff seems to like. The wood and leather is just fantastic, but I would have expected more toys. CD player's an option, and you can't get a tape out without changing out of fifth. There's no sunshine roof, there's no ejector seat, and there's no airbags. James Bond may be licensed to kill, but the DB7 is not. Q may have some work to do on the inside then, but he can leave the engine well alone, because it's a gem. <laughs> The block is basically a 3.2 litre Jaguar unit. Remember, this car was originally conceived as a replacement for the XJS. Remember too that both companies are now owned by Ford. The background then is clear enough, but the foreground can get awfully blurred. That's because the supercharger Aston fits to the six-cylinder motor results in 335 brake horsepower. In a turbocharged car, you have to wait until the blower girds its loins and starts to strut its stuff. But with a supercharger, the power is always right there, right when you need it. As always, I would prefer a V8, but this is the next best thing. It's helped along by a lightweight body too, so that here we have a car which gets from 0 to 60 in 5.9 seconds. A car which can hit 160 miles an hour. Impressed? Well... To be honest, Tiff wasn't. He pointed out that the 928 and the Ferrari 355 are faster and that they handle better. But as usual, dear old thing, he's missing the point. You see, with the Aston, in the back you get a couple of seats which are vaguely usable. 
Round here you have a boot which can handle rather more than a bag of sugar. And it has the sort of restrained good looks that the Germans, the Italians and the Japanese just don't understand. Now don't get me wrong, I love the Porsche 928. The Ferrari 355 is the best car I've ever driven, but this is just so elegant. Now it might be outgunned, but would you just look at this? That was built by a man, not R2-D2. It's also worth mentioning the brakes on this car because they'll haul it from 70 miles an hour to a standstill in exactly half the distance quoted in the highway code. So don't follow me too closely. Despite its ability to stop like it's hit a wall, this is no technological tour de force. It's more a tour de south coast with a tartan rug over its knee. There's no adaptive damping, no traction control, no gold lining for the engine bay. This is not a Game Boy. It's not Nouvelle Cuisine. It's good, wholesome and traditional, like meat pie and two veg, neither of which are lentils. I'd rather have a Ferrari 355. They do cost about the same. But when I'm old and wizened and my nose is bent and grey, I may well go knocking on Aston Martin's door and asking, are you building them properly yet? I know of two DB7s which, while being tested by colleagues on the magazines, have suffered from, let's be polite, let's say difficulties. And on this one, this window doesn't shut properly, the headlamps keep steaming up, there's a funny whirring noise in fifth gear and so many pieces of trim have fallen off, I could hold a car boot sale. Using a car like this every day is rather like putting the most exquisite crockery you have in the dishwasher. It will break. And here's the deal. The Porsche 928 is mass-produced. It's reliable. So is the Ferrari 355. So is the BMW 850i. A Mercedes-Benz S-Class is invincible. Now, people are going to want and expect total reliability from their DB7. And I've just got the most horrible, horrible feeling they're going to be disappointed. If I'm wrong, and believe me, I hope I am, and if you're over 50, then you will not find a better car than the DB7. James Bond should have the vantage, but his dad, Mr. Albert Bond of Acacia Avenue, Hazelmere, should have one of these. Personally, I think I'm having more fun than Jeremy, and these martinis are powerful things. Perhaps an Aston Martini is the answer. No? Well, okay. But whilst I'm still rather busy, and we're on the subject of all things British and Jeremy's favourites, what always goes with Aston Martin? Jaguar, of course. Oh, happy days are here again. Do, 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 do. Today's the day. Finally, after months of littering their factory entrance with my nylon house, Jaguar has agreed to let me drive the new XK8. For ages now, there's been talk of it in the newspapers and magazines. And in true British style, the self-knocking has already begun. There have been mutterings in the rectory and whispers in the village hall. Is it a Ford in drag? Is it a worthy successor to the U-Type? Does it look too like an Aston DB7? Well, let's find out. I'm just taking this for a quick spin around the block, right? I won't be long. Gullible man. If you're going to test a car like this properly, you've got to get away from the choked up Midlands and go where the air is pure. 
the fields are green and the sun always shines. That's better. Now then, let's take a look at this thing. What shape are you in? Well, it's a bit like Oasis, the band that is. See, all over the place there are very definite and very successful hints of the 60s. Look at the radiator grill. That is straight off an E-type. Same goes for the power bulge on the bonnet. And you see these curved flanks and the way the wheels are hidden away in the arches? Remind you of something? The trouble is, it all goes a bit wrong at the back. And I blame golf. You see, Jaguar has made the boot big enough to accommodate two sets of clubs, which is all very commendable. But I rather wish they hadn't bothered. If they'd only forgotten about golfers, who are a silly breed of people, and not bothered with those rear seats, which are next to useless anyway, they might have ended up with a car that wasn't just good-looking, but was actually better-looking than a DB7. So, what about the intestines? Well, there it is, only the fourth different type of engine that Jaguar has ever made. A 290 horsepower, quad cam, 32 valve V8. And just in case you're thinking it's a warmed up Ford lump, let me tell you this. Yes, it's assembled in a Ford factory, but there are only two parts that come from the American giant. A plug in the sump and the chip that activates the immobilizer in this key. The key that unleashes the beast. V8s, by their very nature, cannot be completely smooth, and nor are they renowned for their sprightliness. They're big, thumping powerhouses, and this one is no exception. The XK8 should really have been called the license loser. This is one of those cars that's always going much, much faster than you think it is. You reckon you're doing about 70, and then you glance at the speedo, and you're doing 150. Come on, ease it down. Ease it down. That's better. The ease with which it lollops along makes it a superb Grand Tourer. But those of you who know the old XJS will testify that on roads like this, Grand Tourers go all to pieces. But if you take the XK8 by the scruff of its neck, if you really work this brand new five-speed automatic gearbox, if you stick it into the corners to get the computerized suspension system working, you will find, oh wow, that Sylvester Stallone really can play Hamlet. The XK8 is more agile than an XJS, but it's still not a sports car. It's a heavyweight which will tolerate brutal treatment on brutal roads, but quite frankly, it would rather you grew up and slowed down a bit. Now, let's move from areas where the car is good to areas where it is simply outstanding. Whether you have the optional computerized adaptive suspension or ordinary springs and dampers, the ride comfort is extraordinary. I know from past experience this road surface has all the smoothness of unironed linen, but in this, it feels like I'm driving across a field of velvet. Never felt a thing. This car is so comfortable it just eats up the miles, covering vast distances with no effort at all. This is the kind of car you would want to drive until the Arabic oil fields ran dry.
I don't think you'd ever tire of the interior either. As you'd expect from Jaguar, there's that womb-like, hemmed-in feeling. There's leather and there's wood. And would you look at it, a great slab of timber, an upended church pew, none of the polished bits of sawdust you get in a Mercedes or a BMW. I love the way they've recessed the dials in these pods. I love the toys. The stereo is fantastic. But there are one or two problems. I think there should be some chrome around this gear shifter. And if the computer is clever enough to know the driver's doors open, surely it should also know that drivers has an apostrophe in it. Right, let's talk bank managers. Will the XK8 cause yours to start foaming at the mouth and barking like a dog? Sadly, no. At £48,000, it's £9,000 cheaper than a BMW 840. It does 25 miles to the gallon, which is incredible, and there's a three-year warranty. Jaguars have always offered good value, but comparatively speaking, this really is bargain basement. So, there you have it. The XK8 is basically a nightmare on Elmstrasse. It's three times better than the 8 Series BMW and five times better than the old XJS. But most important of all, it costs just a little over half as much as a DB7. Frankly, it's my kind of car too, a big V8 GT. It's magnificent, but I couldn't buy one. If push came to shove, I just couldn't do it. This is what I'd go for, the XK8 convertible. It's got an even more bulbous bottom than the coupe, and it's £7,000 more expensive. But, but, oh, just but, all right. Unfortunately, I have to take this car back to the factory. Still, no rush. No rush at all. I have to admit that the Astons and Jaguars are much more Jeremy than me. They're just too large and overweight for my taste. A bit like Jeremy, I suppose. What I need is something that's lighter and more nimble, something that really comes alive in my hands. And Porsche have come up with a real beauty. The world's most eagerly awaited sports car took just three years to develop. The Porsche Boxster charged with taking the mark into the next century alongside the legendary 911. Porsche haven't built an all-new car since the 928 some 20 years ago. And when the Boxster was first launched as a concept car, it drew a great deal of positive interest. The production version isn't quite so art deco, but it's still, well, very distinctive. The front is a little bit of 911 and an awful lot of lights. The back could be the front, but overall it's this mixture of looks that makes the car so attractive. Time for the best bit. Porsche have returned to the flat six boxer configuration as found in the 911. A boxer engine in a roadster chassis, hence the name Boxster. The big difference now though is the new engine is water cooled and mid mounted. Two and a half litres provides 204 horsepower, 0 to 60 in under seven seconds at a top speed of 149 miles an hour. 
but it's the way the whole package works. Engine with chassis, chassis with controls, that makes it a special car to be in. And when you drop it down a gear or two and give it some revs, it sounds perfect. The handling of the Porsche is also superb. It goes just where you want it to go, with a little hint of safe understeer when you push it to the limit. But of course, with the traction control off, I can probably also get the back out if I want to. Now, you might think it's all fast cars and fun on Top Gear, but then just when you're enjoying yourself, uh, you sort of find you haven't got any gears anymore. Now, we've found a bit of plastic under the car. We're somewhere in the middle of Germany, and... Dan, have you phoned Porsche yet? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, how much money do you think they'll pay us for development costs? No, no. <laughs> oh, no. It's a fault that cropped up on a couple of the pre-production launch cars and will doubtless never happen again. But as we waited for Porsche to arrive and carry out a five-second repair, everyone decided something very profound. We'd actually rather have a Boxster than a 911. True, the 911 is faster and has rear seats, but it's twice the price of the 35 grand Boxster. You are looking at Porsche's idea of a bargain. So, what do you get for your £35,000? Well, for a start, you get a roof that does this. It takes just 12 seconds to raise the roof with Porsche's new Z-shaped system, which keeps you snug and quiet, even at top speed. You get a boot in the front and a boot in the back, where, with the engine hidden in the middle, the water and oil fillers are located. You get a leather interior, these very attractive instruments, and airbags on both sides. But you have to pay extra for air conditioning, the Tiptronic automatic gearbox, and a hard roof for the winter. But now, it's still the summer, and I want to make the most of it. The thing is, I'm not quite sure what I'm supposed to be comparing this box to with. It's certainly got all the fun of a lot of the £20,000 sports cars that are now on the market, but it's also got the luxury and quality of a much more expensive car. Perhaps the new Mercedes SLK will it be its big competitor, or the new BMW M3 Roadster. But paper comparisons are redundant because get behind the wheel of a Boxster and you realise it really is in a class of its own and will see Porsche safely into the next century. Order now or join a long waiting list. There was a time when the prancing horse of Ferrari was invincible on the racetrack. And even now, the cars which still race in the blood-red colours of Italy, and whose name sounds like an exhaust note, are the epitome of motoring romance. Now, it's hard enough to get a test drive in any Grand Prix car, but to get a drive in a factory Formula One Ferrari is nigh on impossible. But we were the first television company in the entire world to do just that. This is the car that Alan Cross drove in the 1990 World Championship. But tonight, Alan Prost isn't behind the wheel. Tiff is. 
Tiff, Tiff, Tiff. Now, are you sure you know what you're doing? Jeremy, you forget I've been a Grand Prix driver. OK, it was a few years ago, this but... This is you... my point exactly, Tiff. This is semi-automatic, this car. But, Jeremy, it's even easier nowadays. Look, you just have these little paddles, you... Up on the right, down on the left. I've been practising it all the way here on the aeroplane, up on the right, down on the left. You, you could do it. Do you fit all right? Fit? I came here to Italy especially two weeks ago. I've had my own seat made. I fit like a glove. Well, all right then. Drive carefully. Don't be ridiculous. The day wasn't without its frustrations. Can you hear the misfire? The problem is not... It, it, I cannot use full throttle. That's the problem. Thoroughbred stallions need constant attention and this one hadn't been run for over four years. But in the end, all was well and was I happy. The light there, a bit of a twitch, trying to feed the power in. Easy to oversteer the cars in the slow speed corners. But of course, in the higher speed, when the aerodynamics really come into the equation, then they grip like glue. Well, I'm just beginning to get a feel for this machine. I'm still nowhere near the braking point, streaming down its very seventh gear, probably 180 miles an hour. Curvy, and I'm going to end a six and a throttle, and all of a sudden, one, four, three, two, pick up the throttle, feed it in, like I can feel it under steering, then I'll hit a cone there, oh, under steering, why now, feed the back, yes, three, into the left, the puff comes up, oh, a bit of a slide there, this, I can get carried away with. All in all, it was an incredible experience. But we weren't in Italy just for a bit of Formula One fun, because Ferrari have now made a Grand Prix car for the road. And here it is, the Ferrari F50. By no means the prettiest car ever to emerge from the pin and free in a styling studio, but on this occasion the skin is less important than the heart. That V12 engine is basically the same as the one in Tiff's car. It's bolted directly to the bulkhead, so it becomes an integral part of the chassis. They've even mounted the rear suspension to the gearbox. The tub is made from carbon fibre, ten times stronger than steel, but so light I could pick it up with one hand. And it's the same story with the body. You can even see the weave of the carbon fibre through the paint. Then there's the suspension. In all cars, there are rubber components to make the ride more comfortable, but you won't find them in a Grand Prix car, so you won't find them in here either. I'm sorry to have been so technical, but it's important you know why this car can do what it does. 
Even at this speed, a McLaren would have steamship body roll, but the F50 stays as flat as a mill pond through the corners. If you take it to the raggedy edges of the handling envelope, if you try to corner like Schumacher, there will be understeer. But for mortal man, it's the ever-present threat of sudden snap oversteer that loosens the bowels. Because there's no rubber in the suspension, bang, you turn the wheel, and it's just incredible. I know of no car that turns into a corner like this one. Nothing. This is part of the reason. Those fans not only cool the engine, but also suck the front of the car down, giving more downforce, more grip, and therefore less chance of becoming a human fireball. Not that there's an awful lot to burn in here. I've no carpets, I've no nothing. 329,000 pounds, that's what this car costs. So naturally you would expect a little gimmick, a little novelty, and here it is. You turn this lever and the window goes up. Turn it the other way and it goes down. Very clever. Of course the point is electric windows add weight. And this car has been paired to the bone. Except of course for the engine, which following traffic gets to gore pat. Briefly. When you hit the throttle in the F50, it's like pressing the plunger on a detonator. It explodes from 0 to 60 in 3.7 seconds, and the top speed is a simply enormous 202 miles an hour. Oh my God! Young 5,000 RPM, it's just astonishing! It's part Werewolf, part Pavarotti, you just have to keep stirring this gear lever to keep it up there. But before I burst with excitement, there is one question that needs answering. How does it stack up to Tef's car? F1 car wins, of course, but you'd be amazed at how close the F50 gets. Right up to 160 miles an hour, there really isn't that much in it. Of course, unlike the F1 car, the F50 has to meet noise and emission regulations. It's limited to 8,500 RPM. They've taken the engine up to 4.7 litres in a semi-successful quest for torque. Ferrari's dream of making a road-going Grand Prix car has been dogged by compromisers. The end result is a car of few superlatives. An Aston Martin Vantage is more powerful, and the McLaren is a lot faster. And if you look at the intelligent question of power to weight ratios, this is even beaten by the old F40. What on earth is happening here? A 500 horsepower Ferrari? And Clarkson is not convinced. People are going to buy this car, they're going to put it in museums, they're going to put it in garages and they'll trail it once in a while to a car show. Ah, uh, come to think of it, I can't really blame them. And that is my main concern. I love it to death, but it's too fast, it corners too quickly and there's no warning of impending doom. Or perhaps I'm not a good enough driver for it. This blood-red monster, I know, would end up giving me the blues. Give me the choice between this and the cheaper, less impressive, less awe-inspiring 355. And I'd take a 355 every time. And that way, I'd stay alive. And talking of staying alive, nowadays even James Bond realises that you don't need something big and brash to escape the enemy. 
and I was sent on a special mission to Madeira to put his latest set of wheels to the test. Well, someone had to go to Madeira to try BMW's latest entry into the sports car market. Their bargain basement, Z3. It might surprise you to learn that since its launch almost a year ago, 35,000 Z3 Roadsters have slid off the production line in the USA. It's just that the Americans haven't got round to building any right-hand drive cars yet. But the 3,300 1.9-litre models already on order in Britain are due to start arriving in February. Doubtless the owners will be delighted, but for me, the one real drawback is that the 140 horsepower from the four-cylinder power plant just isn't enough. Now they've brought out this 192 horsepower, 2.8 litre version, and it still isn't enough, because this chassis is so good, it just soaks it up. They give you traction control, but you really don't need it in the drive. The steering weight is just right, and the gear change, short and slick. The classic BMW front-engine rear-wheel drive layout can't quite match the mid-engine Boxster when it comes to the handling stakes. With a touch too much understeer, it pushed into a corner too quickly. But the only real complaint I have is the lack of a decent exhaust note to add that all-important finishing touch. Now, that might sound like a trivial complaint. But in a car like this, designed to appeal to the enthusiastic driver, it's an almost unpardonable sin. You not only want the feeling of going fast, you want the sound as well. Along with the extra 50 horsepower, the six-cylinder 2.8 model gets a wider track and wheels front and rear with arches to match, which, allied to a bigger front spoiler and larger air intakes, helps to give the Z3 a more purposeful look. The retro lines are certainly not to everyone's taste, but, like the Boxster, its oddness is its attraction. And, despite being made in the States rather than in Germany, the whole car has the kind of build quality you would expect from a BMW, though Madeira's less-than-perfect roads did reveal a little scuttle shake. As you'd expect from BMW, the driving position is perfect, although you do tend to sit on rather than in these seats, and this steering wheel is a tad on the large side. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of open-top motoring, but I have to admit that even with the side windows down, there really is very little buffeting in this Z3. And if it does rain... It's got one of the fastest hoods in the business. The only trouble is, it really does make it look like a pram. And if that's too much effort, an electric hood is on its way this summer when the 2.8 models reach the showrooms with a price tag of around £27,000. The Z3 is a good car, but it doesn't quite hit the spot like the Porsche Boxster. It's less involving, lacking slightly in handling excitement and exhaust tone satisfaction. Then again, it's a whole £10,000 cheaper than the Porsche. But BMW may yet wrest the sports car crown from its rivals when the M version of the Roadster arrives at the end of the year with 320 horsepower on tap. And that really could be the icing on the cake. The only trouble with all these Porsches, Ferraris and BMWs is that they're, well, not British. So to find a supercar which wears Union Jack boxer shorts on its little ends and which was designed by a man known to consult his dog, we sent Jeremy for a day out at the seaside.
Thanks very much. Wonderful. Blackpool seems to be stuck in a different century. There's something very old-fashioned, very decent about the place. And the same, it must be said, goes for its fish and chips, which, let's face it, are a lot more comfortable on the nether regions than chicken chili jalfrezi. But here's the thing, OK, if you could combine the old-world charm of Blackpool with some of its thrills, you'd have a hell of a car! Bloody hell! Fire! And here is just such a car, a blend of traditionalism and gut-wrenching power. It's a TVR, and this is where it's made. Now, most car factories are quiet, clean, automated places. But this, remember, is Blackpool. What they do in this ramshackle collection of prefabs is fit huge engines a box girder bridges and then they garnish the finished product with a bit of craftsmanship. It's not like a normal car factory and that's not surprising because it doesn't have a normal boss. Peter Wheeler doesn't like frills, he doesn't like suits and he's the only man in the world who smokes more than I do. I like him a lot which is why we'll start off with a simple question. So Pete, What's with the plastic body shells, then? It has a plastic body for a variety of reasons, but it's the last thing that should put people off buying the car. The, the material of the body is, for example, ten times as expensive as steel. The only advantage of it to us is the fact that the tooling costs are a fraction of those for a steel-bodied car. The big advantage of fiberglass is that it is probably one of the best any, energy-absorbing materials that there is. It was said not long ago that BMW had spent more money on the tooling for the 7 Series dash than TVR spent in 40 years of its history on development, the whole of its car range, and it's probably correct. Uh, what it enables us to do is to make cars that are not made out of whim, but they are not we don't do any market research whatsoever and basically if we produce a car and everybody says Ugh, we don't like it we're scrapping a hundred grand and not 500 million so it allows some flexibility so far we haven't in recent years at least scrapped uh, even a hundred grand worth of tooling but that's probably more luck than judgment it may also have something to do with Ned now Ned I understand that you're Chief stylist here at TVR. I think we've got one of the arty types here that won't talk. Do you need an agent or something? His styling phase is over now. He, he, he basically sits in the accounts and runs the accounts department at the moment. But when he was a puppy, he, he did have a hand in some styling on, on the Camara. Basically, he was trying to savage the guy who was trying to style it at the time and missed his head and, and bit a chunk out of the car. So the indicator hole on yes. a Camara was styled by Ned. Yes. <laughs> now, no one has ever accused TVR of making a boring car. However, I have heard questions asked about reliability. Well, this car here has done 69,000 miles, the last 3,000 of which were done by me on a huge trans-European thrash. I got to know it pretty well, and I can tell you it felt and still does feel as tight as Vanessa May's G-string. But look, we're not here to talk about used TVRs. We're here because there's a new one. So far this year, Volkswagen, Porsche and Volvo have dropped their coupés because they haven't been selling. But TVR reckons this one will buck the trend. 
It's called the Cerbera. It costs less than £40,000. And I won't beat about the bush here. It's just slightly better than fan bleeding tastic. It's hard to know where to start, but I guess in here is as good a place as any. But it really is very, very spacious. I could join the brigade of guards and there'd still be enough space above my head for the requisite hat. I don't even have this seat pushed all the way back, and that's very rare in a car these days. No, make no mistake, the Cerbera is a comfortable beast if you're tall. It rides well too, thanks to the long wheelbase, it has a suppleness that I simply wasn't expecting. They say it's the first TVR for 10 years to suit the family man, <laughs> but only if you've defied science and managed to give birth to a couple of hamsters. Those back seats are pretty tiny. But look, if you want four seats, buy a Mondeo. If they'd made it a proper four-seater, it wouldn't look so good, and it wouldn't go quite so quickly. For the last 15 years, TVR has used the old Land Rover V8, but now they've gone into the engine business themselves. With, it must be said, some pretty startling results. I don't have any figures to hand, but I can tell you this. I am driving the noisiest, most exciting and fastest car this side of a Lamborghini Diablo. If you want to achieve the same effect as this car in your kitchen, just put the engine from a Type 42 destroyer in your tumble dryer. Basically, we designed the engine as a, as, a, as a race engine. It was my idea at the time that if we wanted to expand, we ought to make something that we could sell to other people. So we've ended up with a, a 75 degree V8 with a flat plane crank. Uh, the bottom half of the engine up to the heads is exactly as you would see in a current Formula One engine. To make the engine more compact and fit the car, we chose to go for an unusual cylinder head design in, in such that it's a, a single overhead, two valve layout, which, because obviously on a road car you can't use the very high revs that, that Formula One engines rev to, to try and get the torque a bit lower down. And I'm not sure Lexus would want to come and buy it for its refinement, but uh, uh, it's a very sporting engine indeed. There are a lot of people who flash pretend horsepower numbers around. I can tell you when you've got 360 horsepower in a car that weighs just over a ton, it becomes a very quick car. Three hundred and sixty horsepower. <laughs> it has got to have a government health warning on it somewhere. It looks like something out of Aliens. I mean, this... This is weapons grade power. From naught to a hundred miles an hour, the Cerbera will outdrag a tornado jet. Out techno it as well. You don't open this huge door with anything so mundane as a door handle. No, you just think your way in. It's the same story on the inside. I love the way they've grouped these instruments above and below the steering wheel. I love the buttons on the steering wheel. I love the swoopiness of this dash. It's like something out of the 50s, the 2050s. A time when you don't start a car with anything so dull or tedious as a key. Engine start.
Don't get confused here, though. This is not a gizmo car. It has no sunroof, no traction control, no trip computer. It does have a stereo, but you may have noticed it hasn't been on. We've hardly played any music because the Cerbera brought its own along. Just listen to this noise. Eat your heart out, Tchaikovsky. When it comes to a good old tune, the Cerbera makes your 1812 sound like Michael Bolton. Today, this is about the only all-British car you can buy, but that's only part of the reason why I absolutely adored it. It's like a cross between Jonah Lomu and a Dodge Viper. I just couldn't help driving it until I ran out of land. You know, whenever I road test a car on top gear, I'm usually left at the end with one abiding memory. The Ferrari 355, the best. The Lamborghini Diablo, brutal. Jaguar, comfortable. Nissan Sunny. Well, there's the exception that proves the rule. And this. Fast. Very, very fast. For a while, it seemed that the days of the big supercar were coming to an end. The Jaguar XJ220 is long gone, and production of the McLaren F1 is soon to end, whilst all the Ferrari F50s have been sold. But the new Le Mans GT regulations demand a production-based model, and Porsche have been the first to react with their new 911 GT1. Up close, your first impression of a GT1 is that it's a squashed 911. Purposeful rather than beautiful. A compromise between road car regulations and racing design demands. Think of it as a 200 mile an hour office, finished in naked carbon fibre. Time to go to work. prototype which covered over 5,000 miles of testing including one non-stop 27-hour test at Paul Ricard before the GT1 made its debut at Le Mans. The bodywork is all the very latest high-tech carbon fibre but the chassis is good old-fashioned steel weighing 1,050 kilos with over 600 horsepower this Hockenheim short circuit is a little bit too tight for such a machine and in fact I'm only using five of these six synchromesh gears around here but I'm going to be using all of the 8,000 rev limits. But first into the pits for a check over and a chance to see the latest supercar laid bare. Up front, the white steel is the road car 911 bit, but at the back, the engine is mid, not rear mounted. On a racing car, form follows function, and everything is designed to be got at quickly during a race, and that includes the brakes. Carbon, of course, but for the first time, carbon with ABS, so it stops as well as it goes. this 
11 GT handle. How does it compare to the McLaren F1 that I've tested and the Lister Storm that I race? Well, to start with, I sit on the right in the Lister, in the middle in the McLaren, and on the left in the Porsche, and they're all about as different as that. The Porsche is certainly no easy ride, with a bouncy front end that keeps you guessing and a snappy rear that keeps you alert, while the twittering turbochargers probably provide more power than the opposition. Snatches a bird! Full throttle! Very well balanced in there, if there's no bumps, it's lovely! If there's bumps, they're pogos! So which would I choose out of the three cars? They all lap within a second of each other. And of course, because I'm biased, I like my big British engine, Lister Storm. But if I had to choose between this Porsche and the McLaren, I'd have to take the Porsche. sure that you'll ever see that many GT1s on the roads, but this new supercar looks certain to provide Porsche with a lot more places on top of the podium. Now, I arrived in this beautiful Mercedes-Benz 300 SL from the past. But I think I'll leave with something a bit more modern. Something that perhaps is the most perfect sports car yet made. Something that just has to be read. The Ferrari 355. Yeah. Yeah. 